can't resentence in the first place is because through brain science, they learned that our brains don't develop. It doesn't fully develop until we're 25. And so, with that in mind, they said that we are, our brains is not developed, we not, we, we immature, we reckless, we prone to these things because our brains haven't, haven't um, matured. And so, I want to add this too, is that what made my personal story unique is because when I was in a hole and I made the decision to change my life, I actually was 25 years old, but keep in mind, this was five years before the case that actually changed the law even came into play. So just in life, knowing that I was sentenced to die in prison, I made a decision to go in the opposite direction, even though I was in prison, almost like swimming upstream like a salmon, because prison is so unpredictable that you can't really plan how things will go in here. But the decision I made was, was I was, I was, uh, I guess my rock bottom was that, that's how, 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 how low I felt that, and at the same time, it was also how mature I had became and can, 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 can like grow from my mind being developed. I, can, I made the decision to do that, and I, I stood on it. Like I said, that was like five years before the law even changed. And by the time I did get resentenced, it had been maybe like six or seven years. It was, it was probably like six or seven years since the law had changed. So uh, ultimately, like it had been 11 years since the day where I decided to change my life that I was getting a And um, You know, when I went to court, you know, I had family that flew in from different states, uh, college professors who I worked with in prison. Some of the people that we was uh, mentoring kids with, you know, was there. The victim's family was there. And, you know, the judge, it was almost like everything was pre-scripted because it was like, when I went to court, he made me speak first for my attorney, and I spoke, which is usual, it's kind of unusual because when you're in a court situation, but the prosecutor normally speaks first and then you defend yourself, but he made me speak first. I spoke and uh, I was able to speak to the family for the first time and uh, tell them the truth. You know, as a man, you know, I was telling them the truth as a mature, man, I was being honest with him about what actually happened and how things happened and what I had done, and I was uh, apologetic and uh, remorseful for what I was doing, but after I spoke, the prosecutor spoke, and then the judge, he whipped out some paper, you know, that he had, and he just started reading from what he had already wrote, and he sentenced me to like 42 to 60 years, mm. you know, and no, it was, it was, uh, it was, uh, man, it was, I was, I was kind of hurt. Can you clear this up real quick before you continue? So, it's not a cap on it? It's not, like, they can only give you 30 no, or 40 no, years? it's not a cap on life. In fact, they got laws. They, they got a house bill, four house bills, and four Senate bills. The Senate bill numbers is 848 to 851. I'm not sure what the House bills numbers are, but they, what they're trying to do is eliminate life without parole for juveniles and change the sentence. So, that's what right now you can still get life without parole, and there's a lot of people who have went and got resentenced, and they was resentenced to life without parole. Juveniles, guys who committed their crime when they were juveniles, and it's juveniles who caught cases, they are still being sentenced to life without, in prison without the possibility of parole. Do you, do you feel like some of these teens do deserve life without parole? What you say? Do you feel like some of these teens do deserve life without parole? Do I, do I feel that I deserve life No, no, parole? not you, but some of these teens. Do you feel like they, some people actually do deserve life without parole that's under the age of 18? No, because, I mean, that calls society into question because if, if you got all this technology, all these people with doctor's degrees, uh, master's degrees, uh, all these professions, uh, uh, psychologists, and you mean to tell me that uh, people can't be healed or people not deserving of a, a second chance? And, you know, like, the, 
country itself is, is, is the, the basic principles that the, the, the constitution in this country is based on is Christianity and the Torah. And, uh, you know, to be honest with you, I thought about that. And, and this, is, this is my thinking. Moses killed, killed a man. Uh, John, in the Bible, he killed the man. Paul, I think it was, killed the man. And he's responsible for, like, writing 90% of the New Testament. But, so that means that if people believe that it's people who deserve to die in prison, if they, if they kill somebody, and especially when they write them, develop it, what, that calls into question, how, how should you feel about Paul? He killed somebody. You know, he, he, do we go away to New Testament? Because Paul killed somebody, or do we follow God? And, and do we 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 do we look at people and just throw them away, and as like as if they can't be healed? I, I just think I don't think it's nobody that that I don't I don't view human beings as being throwaways, man. You know, and, and be, you know, honest with you, the way I was raised, I didn't value my life. So when I was 17 years old, and the things I was doing in the street. It wasn't hard to not take a life because my life wasn't valuable to me either. But when I became older and more mature, I understood, like, life is precious. You know, life is valuable. And to just say, throw it away because a person made a mistake when their brain wasn't undeveloped. And another thing we call them question is this. You can't even buy cigarettes at 17. You can't get married. You can't work certain jobs. You can't go to the army. So it's already things in place in society that takes the responsibility from a teenager, but yet we can hold them responsibly criminally. So, well, well, what's the difference between the law? You know, like, what what's stopping us from saying a 12-year-old could go buy a bottle of alcohol? Well, he's a 12 year old. He's not 21. He's, he's not mature enough. He would he wouldn't you know he wouldn't be able to handle himself you know. But the same person can be charged. You know, because they even charge a 12 year old with a crime though. Like we criminalizing people without finding out how to help them. So like in my case, I was raised in the street, and even though. Now I look back like I was raised wrong, but to me it was right. And I'm like, I didn't know the difference because I never seen people working. I seen people selling drugs and I really, my, my world was shaped around crime because that's what I seen. That's what, what, what I found or that's what I, I was shown to find value in. So as a child trying to process this, I'm doing what, I'm going to live up to it to the fullest. So. I think that I think that we gotta take a step back and be like, we gotta really look at people don't really wanna do this. Like look at look in these households, look inside of these communities and see how children are being raised. Cause on one hand you say, Well, if a parent raised a child like this, we have to send social service inside the house and take the child. But on the other hand, when a child makes a mistake from the damage that's been done based on how he was raised, he's criminally responsible. But hold up, he can't go buy beer. He can't even buy cigarettes. Matter of fact, don't send him to the army. But criminally, he's out of here. Throw him away. And then, you gotta think. When I came to prison, I came to prison with me. Now, now, nowadays, they sentence juveniles when they come to prison, they sentence them to facilities for children their age or teenagers their age. So, what made them come to that conclusion now? And then think about this. What about the damage that was done to the children and the teenagers who were sent to prison who didn't have a fighting chance up in here because they were sent where the adults were at, and they were sent where did nobody care about their well-being, and, and somehow we still seem to make a way and better ourselves, and, and in a lot of cases, even when we were sent to die in prison. So is this a guy you think needs to be thrown away, or is this a guy you, if you get, if given the opportunity, because he created one for himself, if given the opportunity, he could actually be a, he could add to society. In fact, people will believe him when he say, don't do something, 
more so than they would the people who don't have those experiences because they know that that person can relate. That's that's absolutely true. I, I had to ask you that just you know when people ask what makes somebody deserve another chance, but yeah, you, you, you're right. Uh, Moses, Saul, they all killed somebody. And, and you're right. This this country based off the tour and in the New Testament. My next question is to you: Have you ever participated in the National Lifers Association, and do you think that it is actually uh, effective? I was at a, a, a few you think it's effective? And, uh, ever since COVID came, they shut it down. So we haven't gotten to normal, normal. We haven't gotten back to normal for these facilities yet. But I have in the past. Do you think it's effective, or does it cause any change, or what? I didn't catch the uh, end of the question. Do you think that it's effective, or causes any change? Say those classes. Those, yeah. Uh, yeah. The the, the meetings. Melanic or are you a part of the Nation of Islam? I'm a uh, follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad under the leadership of Mr. Louis Farrakhan. What made you come into that real quick? Huh? What made you come under that uh, real quick? Uh, man, when I first came to prison, I, I wasn't raised with a father figure, so I was the kind of guy when I was younger, you had to show me he was the biggest and baddest person. Period. You know, but from a distance, I used to watch the brothers, um, particularly like Raphael X and a lot of the brothers. I noticed they was clean, they they was groomed, and they was disciplined. And, and you know, I would hear a brother get confronted on the yard. You have one minute remaining. About things that he wasn't supposed to be doing, and I felt like like. If I was going to change, that was the example that I felt fit me the best, fit, fit, fit me the best but I also had a couple conflicts inside my, my you know, as far as, like, this prison, and I didn't want to change my religion, but it was more like, along the lines of, like, the more, the more, the, the more mature I became, and the more I learned, it just, it was the best decision I ever made in my life, you know, as far as uh, growth. And becoming uh, spiritually inclined, uh, it helped me through my journey, and I, 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 it protected me from a lot of pitfalls that most people go through in prison. I, I, I was spared it because I was practicing, and I had a support group that was that was strong and genuine. You know, 